Thank you all for coming. Welcome to a special event, George Takei, from Barbed Wire to Broadway. I'm Kermit Roosevelt. I will be moderating our discussion tonight. And tonight we're very fortunate, of course, to have George Takei joining us for a discussion about an unfortunate chapter in our nation's history, the incarceration of over 120,000 persons of Japanese descent, most of them birthright American citizens, during the Second World War. George, of course, was a part of that. His own childhood experiences in that program informed the currently running Broadway musical Allegiance. George's acting career has spanned actually five decades. It includes many roles. Um, the first one in which I became aware of George was his iconic and unforgettable portrayal of the helmsman of Star Trek, Mr. Sulu, but it in includes many others. And George, of course, is not just an actor. He's also an unprecedented social media presence, and he's an activist for many causes, speaking out for the rights of LGBT people and also Asian Americans and many others. In recognition of his contribution to the relationship between the United States and Japan, he was awarded the Order of the Rising Sun, gold rays with rosette by His, Magister, his Majesty the Emperor of Japan. And please join me in welcoming George Takei. Well, thank you so much for coming. Well, um, thank you for the invitation to be here uh, to uh, Ambassador Sakurai and uh, the uh, Japan Society. It's always a pleasure to be here and to have a discussion with you who has written a, t a novel titled Allegiance. I and have. I'm halfway through that right now, so <laughs> please don't reveal any spoilers for me. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try not to, although I should say you, you probably know a fair amount of the plot already, um, because your own, your own allegiance is based in part on your experiences and inspired by them. I should say, my book is too. Um, I read your autobiography, To the uh. Stars, as part of my research for that book, and I, I found it very inspiring, very touching. In this climate of fear, with some people stoking the fires of racial prejudice and war hysteria, um, President Roosevelt issues Executive Order 9066, authorizing the commander of the Western <coughs> Defense Command to exclude <coughs> such people as he deems necessary from the West Coast. And like the alien land law, this didn't on its face say anything about Japanese ancestry, but everyone knew that's what it was about. Um, and that man, General John DeWitt, then began issuing orders uh, requiring Japanese and Japanese Americans to leave the West Coast. Um, there was no place they could go. Um, and in, in some cases, actually, the orders later said, you can't leave until you're ordered to. And then when we do order you to leave, you will only be allowed to go to one of these camps. Um, so could you, could you now tell us a little bit about your personal experience in that program? Well, uh, I was incarcerated from age five to eight and a half. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> the duration of the war. And uh, I remember the um, tension and anxiety uh, on the part of my parents. Uh, I just celebrated my uh, fifth birthday, and a few weeks after that, uh, my parents got, uh, got uh, my uh, younger brother a year younger, and our baby sister, not yet a year old, and me up very early one morning and dressed us hurriedly, and my brother and I were told to wait in the uh, living room and uh, while they were packing in the, uh, in the bedroom. And we were gazing out the front window and we saw two soldiers with bayonets on their rifles marching up our driveway, stomped up the front porch and banged on the door. I still remember how scary that bang was, very loud. And uh, my father answered it and we were ordered out of our home. My father gave us little packages to carry and my brother and I and my father uh, stood out on the driveway waiting for my mother to come out. And when she uh, finally emerged, she had our baby sis sister in one arm and a huge duffel bag in the other and tears were str uh, streaming down her face. It happened to me uh, at five years old, but that morning, the, the uh, terror of that morning is still embedded in my memory. And that was the beginning of it. Uh, 
we were taken to the, um, the uh, Santa Anita racetrack and the, uh, together with other families that were gathered, were herded over to the uh, horse stalls, the stable area, and we were each assigned a horse stall to uh, live in. For my parents, it was a degrading, humiliating, uh, anguishing experience to go from a two-bedroom home to a narrow, smelly horse stall. But another memory I have is, as a five-year-old kid, I thought it was fun to sleep where the horses sleep. <laughs> so my real memories are quite different and um, quite um, unrepresentative of the real experience that my parents had. Um, my, uh, my father told us that we were going on a long vacation, and uh, it was that for me. It was uh, a fun experience to ride on the train for the first time. We were taken to the swamps of Arkansas, but the first winter it snowed. And uh, I remember how magical that morning was to wake up in the morning and see everything covered in white. And uh, I remember we had snow fights with my father. Uh, we, then we, he showed us that the snowball could be rolled and made into big, great big huge snowballs and we built a snow uh, fort. And so those are the memories I cherish. I also have um, the memory of uh, starting school uh, in a star, uh, black tar paper barrack. And we began the school day every morning with uh, the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I could see the barbed wire fence and the sentry tower right outside my schoolhouse window as I recited the words, with liberty and justice for all. The administering of the loyalty questionnaire, that's, that's one of the many poignant moments in allegiance. Um, and it, it's interesting because it, it did have this paradoxical, contradictory nature um, in almost the same way that the absence of acts of sabotage being claimed as evidence of intent to make some concerted move is, is paradoxical. Um, and there's another sort of, of paradox, I think, in, in, your, in your title, Allegiance, because in part that's about loyalty to the country, and yet the whole program and what you're describing is really sort of an example of the country betraying its people. Um, the Japanese Americans were really betrayed by the U.S. government, and this great injustice was done to them. And in fact, the Supreme Court wasn't willing to say it at the time, but later on, most people agree it was a constitutional violation. So a very hard question, I think, is, is how to respond to that. Um, and Allegiance, I think, does a really good job of dramatizing this choice, um, because within the Japanese American community, there were very different responses. And some people wanted to do everything that they could to prove their loyalty by complying with the program, by volunteering for the armed forces, by answering the call to the draft when eventually, astonishingly, the government began drafting people out of the camps. Um, and then there were other people who said what's truly patriotic is to resist this violation of the Constitution and to defend American ideals by actually challenging it. Um, and so I, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about that, that choice and the way that it comes up maybe in allegiance. The, um, those that bit the bullet and swallowed the bitter taste and uh, went to fight for this country uh, were again put on another outrage, uh, a segregated all Japanese American unit, and they were sent out on the most dangerous missions, and they sustained the highest combat casualty, casualty rate of any other uh, unit, but they also fought with amazing courage and uh, literally her heroism. And they did come back as heroes and the most decorated unit uh, of the entire Second World War, which that, uh, which, uh, the, uh, that record still uh, lasts until um, present time in American military history. Um, they are heroes and they fought with amazing, unbelievable uh, courage and, uh, and uh, patriotism. But I consider the resistors, those that uh, you described as 
standing on principles and, uh, and resisting uh, the draft within a prison camp. And uh, they, their position was a very American uh, position, and they paid a high price as well. They did hard time in federal penitentiaries for standing for American principles, and I consider them just as heroic. And we worked in a love story where uh, the sister of the uh, young man who goes to fight for this country falls in love with the, uh, a resistor. And she works with the resistor, marries him, and they build a family. But when, he, uh, when uh, the young man comes home, that splits a family. family. And that is uh, a symbolic split of this family uh, to uh, symbolize the uh, the, the fracture in the Japanese American community, which we discovered still exists today. People that uh, uh, were on opposite sides and because of that uh, paid a heavy price, on, uh, particularly the resistors families. Uh, there, there were many tragedies in, in those families. Uh, suicides were committed because of the uh, ostracism and the vilification that they got from uh, the uh, uh, veterans that returned, and from the JACL, uh, an organization that plays a part in uh, our drama. Uh, that's a real organization that still exists today. And I am a member of that organization because it became a changed organization after the war. Uh, they fought for uh, many uh, rights and uh, improvement of the uh, condition of Japanese Americans, but uh, the JACL vilified uh, the uh, family of the uh, resistors, and there were some suicides uh, committed by uh, those families, and that that enmity for each other still exists uh, to this day. Uh, something that we dis uh, discovered while we were developing our musical allegiance. So. Uh, uh, there were two kinds of heroes, but both heroes uh, made incredible sacrifices, and that was the price of our winning our democracy. Absolutely, and I, I think it's one of the greatest tragedies, actually, that the two sides on this conflict taking such different paths had such difficulty seeing that they're both forms of patriotism and they're both ways of expressing loyalty to America, to American ideals. Um, going back to the loyalty questionnaire, the loyalty questionnaire was responsible for your family moving from one camp to another. To Tule Lake, right? yes. Can you, can you talk a bit about Tule Lake? Well, my parents answered uh, no uh, uh, to both question 27, which uh, asked, uh, will you uh, bear arms to defend the United States of America? Uh, my mother had uh, three young children, and to, uh, to ask her to bear arms, leaving her children in a prison camp, was outrageous. It was, or that uh, question had to be responded to by everyone over the age of 17 in the camp. And this was being asked of uh, a 17-year-old young man as well as uh, an 87-year-old immigrant uh, lady, uh, uh, preposterous, with no real thought given to it. And uh, so uh, they answered no to those two questions. And because of that, we were transferred to Tule Lake, which was a much harsher camp than the uh, uh, camp uh, that we were first incarcerated in, in Arkansas. Uh, we, we were in the swamps of Arkansas. But I have wonderful memories of uh, the uh, camp there. It was lush. It was verdant. Uh, uh, it's, as I said, it snowed in the wintertime and it was uh, uh, sultry in the summertime, but we had a lot of fun there. But Tui Lake was a dramatic contrast to that. It was a dry lake that in uh, uh, Northern California, right by the Oregon border. It was, uh, the sand there was not soft sand. It was hard, gritty, sharp sand. And there were sh uh, shards of, uh, 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 shells, uh, apparently there were uh, uh, snails in that uh, lake there uh, in ancient times. It had been a dry lake bed for a long time. And uh, very little vegetation. There, there were lots of uh, tumbleweeds 
rolling around in that cold wind there. And uh, many of the people there, particularly the young, young men, were radicalized by the goading, uh, the, these cruel goadings by uh, uh, these, uh, the loyalty questionnaire and the treatment that they received. And they t uh, turned into uh, activists. Uh, they became what was, uh, they, uh, they called themselves Ho Shidang, the Volunteer Corps. And um, they were going to rise up when Japan landed uh, on American soil and to be physically uh, ready for them. They did uh, calisthenics and, uh, and jogged, and, and they jogged in the morning around the block. They wore uh, hachimaki, or the, uh, the headband, and some painted the, uh, the, the military rising sun with the rays uh, in red on their uh, headbands. And they uh, 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 jogged around the block to the cadence, washoi, washoi, washoi. And that's the sound that I woke up to. Uh, many mornings in uh, 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 Turi Lake. And they would end their jogs with banzai, 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 and then they would scatter. I thought the, the description of Tula Lake in your autobiography was really one of the most compelling parts of it. Um, and it's, it's an atmosphere that you also convey in Allegiance, although Allegiance isn't set at Tula Lake. There are sort of Tula Lake elements in there, in, including the stockade and the, the mistreatment of prisoners. Um, and a couple of things struck me as, as so amazing about Tula Lake. One is um, the way in which things just keep getting repeated over and over again. Um, there's a jail within a jail, for instance. And also, the government keeps trying to figure out who the dangerous people are, who the bad guys are, keeps on getting it wrong. Um, although in this case, in Tula Lake, there actually was a pro-Japanese element. And so the other thing that, that Tula Lake demonstrated, to me at least, was you can take a population that's very loyal, that's intensely loyal, as the Japanese-American population was at the beginning of the war, and you can mistreat them and call them enemies, and eventually you will make them into enemies. That's right. At least some of them. Um, and that, that, too, I think, is something that we should definitely bear in mind um, in the present day. Um, and so we've got maybe five more minutes or so to talk, and I, I was thinking um, it's an incredible story. It's a story that should have timeless appeal, um, but it's also a story that has special relevance now, I feel, in light of some of the things that are going on. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you think Allegiance connects to, to current day events. We found that Allegiance is um, eerily relevant to our times today, particularly with the uh, presidential uh, campaign going on and the kind of rhetoric that's being uh, heard, uh, particularly on the Republican side. And there are Repu uh, responsible Republicans who have been reminding uh, people of uh, the uh, 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 extreme, extreme statements uh, being made and, and trying to put that, uh, those in, in context. But, uh, uh, Donald Trump has been particularly guilty of this broad brush uh, uh, sweeping characterization of a whole group of people uh, with that same brush. Yes, the uh, terrorists uh, t uh, today are Muslims, but all Muslims are not terrorists. They're a small fraction of the Mus people of Muslim faith. And to, to make those uh, wild statements banning all Muslims, Muslims from, from coming into the United States is outrageous and un-American. Because when you go to Arlington National Cemetery, the headstones over the uh, people that are buried there have the religious symbols of the faith of, of the people buried there. And there are a number that have uh, Muslim symbols. Muslims have fought for this country and have died for this country. And it is really reckless for that kind of statement uh, to be made by uh, a, a candidate for the presidency of the United States. And so to uh, point that out and to have some fun with it, we have reserved a, fee, uh, a seat for uh, Donald Trump 
at the, the Long Acre Theater. And <laughs> that uh, res uh, reserve seat sign has the number of performances that he's missed from the time that the <laughs> invitation was extended. <laughs> He's now missed 44 performances. <laughs> <laughs> but he has a lot to learn about American history. And it's, it's a really a worrisome thing that so many Americans don't know American history and are, are swept up by this man's rhetoric. Uh, it, it's a commentary on our education. And that's why it's so vitally important that we know our history, and particularly the more shameful parts of American history, because we learn more, I think, from those chapters where our democracy faltered than the glorious chapters that we are exposed to all the time. So uh, uh, people like uh, Donald Trump need to know our history. Uh, the mayor of uh, Roanoke has also expressed the same kind of comment, and uh, I extended an invitation to him and I talked to him over the telephone as well. Oh, you did? He's a charming Southern gentleman. <laughs> and um, he hasn't picked a, uh, uh, responded to the uh, invitation yet, but he extended to me, and he has, uh, he has a um, commission, a uh, human rights commission or something like that, that extended an invitation to me to come and speak there. And so oh. I am serving as an example for the mayor of uh, Roanoke, I have accepted that invitation, and we have set a date when I will visit Roanoke. And I've said to uh, uh, Mayor Bowers of Roanoke that his time to see Allegiance is limited. <laughs> We're closing on the 14th of February, so you better hurry up, because I'm coming to Roanoke. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful of you. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm on I'm a mission. very impressed. <laughs> Well, on, on that point, um, one of the astonishing things to me in this latest little cycle of, of <coughs> hysteria and xenophobia was that people were bringing up the detention of the Japanese Americans not as something we should learn from and not repeat, but as sort of a historical precedent for some of these measures. Um, and I thought that was, that was terrible and bespoke a real lack of historical education and awareness. Um, but this is something that seems to happen over and over again. Um, Americans suffer some sort of attack, we get scared, we overreact, we perpetrate injustice. Later we say we'll never do it again, but we do. Um, so my question for you, and I, I know this is a big question, is how do you think we as a people can get better? Because I, I often quote your father actually in, in my book talks, I say a nation can be no better than its people. And what can we as Americans do do you think, to, to try to minimize the chance that we'll do something like this again? Our education system has to be more comprehensive, and particularly these important chapters of American history. And uh, uh, I personally have taken it on as uh, our mission. Uh, from my 20s on, I've been on uh, speaking tours uh, to universities, to corporate gatherings, to uh, governmental agencies. We founded a museum in Los Angeles called the Japanese American National Museum, where we institutionalize the story of the internment of Japanese Americans. Because as the generation that experienced it die off, and uh, those that didn't experience it uh, uh, don't share it with their descendants, and it's not in the history books, then it will fade away. So by building an, uh, an institution, we institutionalize that story. And by dramatizing it and telling it from the Broadway stage, we again broaden that. And we've been working with the uh, 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 Board of Education with the, the, uh, the sa uh, state of Arkansas, where the two uh, camps uh, were, and we were incarcerated in one of the two. And we've invited teachers, um, uh, a dozen teachers, to come to the Japanese American National Museum every summer. We fund uh, their, uh, their, uh, this program and uh, get them to incorporate the, uh, the chapter of, on the internment to, uh, into the uh, educational curriculum in Arkansas, particularly because it's a 
well, part of Arkansas history. There were two internment camps there. So we, we need to, as individuals and as organizations, to and try to uh, prevent that from happening by uh, ensuring that these sto uh, stories will be remembered uh, in the same way that we remember uh, the great uh, 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 heroes of the civil rights movement uh, and uh, all of the events that happened uh, being made into movies like Selma last year with uh, an amazing performance uh, by a British African uh, playing Dr. Martin Luther King uh, through the, via the media. The, uh, the uh, death camps of Europe uh, have been uh, dramatized in movies, novels, and television uh, programs. I think uh, by uh, telling this story, using the, me uh, the media, and uh, all of the uh, accesses that we have to make this story an organic part of uh, our, our American experience, then we uh, do our bit to keep it from happening again and making America a better America. Donald Trump's motto is make America great again, mm -hmm. but in fact what he's doing is making America disgraced again. <laughs>